Hello and welcome to Mapping Fault Lines, a show by NewsClick, where we discuss some of the major geopolitical developments across the world, as well as its impact on the region. Today, we are joined by Ambassador M.K. Bhadrakumar, and we are going to talk about the Russia-Turkey deal that was signed yesterday, that is March 5th, on the situation in Syria. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So yesterday we saw that uh, President Putin and President Erdogan had a meeting and there was an agreement at the conclusion of that meeting. And it basically laid the ground for a ceasefire after months of conflict in Idlib in Syria. Now there earlier been ceasefires as well. There was one in Astana, there was one in Sochi, there were agreements at least. And uh, this, those agreements never really uh, came into fruition and there was a fresh uh, attack by the Syrian army. So what is what was a specific requirement for this uh, agreement at this point of time? As in, why also why did the sides, especially Syria and Russia, agree to it, considering that they had actually made advances in the offence? To my mind, you know, the gr ground was not uh, prepared well enough mm -hmm. for this uh, uh, summit, right. summit or meeting, whatever. Right. Um, <clears throat> but both sides, Russia was first of all uh, reluctant about this. Mm -hmm. Erdogan floated this idea when first he floated the idea. Uh, Russians said that uh, they have no such plans right. to arrange a meeting. And then, Russia, uh, then uh, Erdogan became rather rowdyish, you know, in the last two weeks, right. sending more troops, weaponry, and right. then shooting left, right, killing Syrians and shooting down Syrian planes and all that. And uh, it almost seemed that a flashpoint is arising. Right. But that's something that uh, neither side wants. Mm -hmm. Neither Erdogan nor Russians want. Uh, regardless of what the Syrians are doing, they're very careful. So then the Russians said that we are considering a meeting. This is how the meeting took place. It must be very clearly understood. There's a parallel move also where Erdogan to see if he could get uh, Macron mm -hmm. and uh, Angela Merkel right. and Putin together to discuss the Russians point blank said that, you know, that uh, uh, they are not interested in that because that would have been really, uh, you know, to put pressure on Putin. Right. So this much uh, has to be understood in the beginning. It was a reluctantly arranged summit. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually it's in the nature of summit that there will be some kind of ground preparations, nothing was done. So this became evident if you... Uh, if you look at closely at it, the body language was very poor uh, at the press conference. And these are two statesmen who have a very warm personal relationship. Right. Nothing, was, nothing of that was there uh, uh, when they appeared after six hours of talk. And uh, Erdogan just blurted out very, very openly mm -hmm. that uh, they had very frank discussions, right. which means that short of quarreling and hitting at each other, right. They had uh, irreconcilable differences. This is what he said. And I was watching Putin's face at that time. It was very grim. Uh, I, one or two things I'll just mention. Then uh, within uh, no time of uh, Erdogan's departure from Moscow, he probably was in the air. You know, he hadn't even reached Turkey. The uh, Russian uh, Sputnik which belongs to RT and Kremlin-funded media agency, they already put out a podcast calling this just political fiction, okay. the summit. So this is just about summit. So what was the, what was the uh, conclusion of that uh, Sputnik uh, piece that uh, this ceasefire is not going to last? So you see, it just about sums up. We don't need to analyze mm -hmm. that uh, the Russian side is very candid about it and even the Turkish side openly says that the differences are so profound. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said earlier, they, neither of them wants this to go into a confrontation. If Erdogan had another option, such as, for example, NATO support or NATO intervention or uh, US intervention, he might have gladly taken it. And in that case, there might have been a different kind of a uh, showdown with face-off with Russia. Right. But uh, much as they are encouraging Erdogan to have a um, scuffle with uh, Putin, mm -hmm. uh, they are also uh, wary of him because of his mercurial nature and his policies are completely um, antithetical to Western interests. Mm -hmm. 
So they are not in a tearing hurry, let me put it like that, to uh, get involved in it right. on his side. So that's a restraining factor for him. So he has no option uh, because he can't take on Russia himself. He knows the limitations. But he can make things difficult for Russia. And Russians also know it, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Putin is uh, very sincere about his wish to end this war. You know, to 2015, they intervened. And there's uh, much uh, uh, expenditure right. involved in it, uh, financial underwriting, this one. And Assad came almost within sight of a total victory. And Putin at one point had even said that the war is over. Mm -hmm. But now what is uh, developing is the specter that is haunting Russia is also that, you know, that there could be a quagmire. Yeah. Uh, everything is suddenly up in the air. This is, uh, this is the uh, summing up of the summit, uh, you know, uh, from, a, uh, from a bird's eye view right. that you get. Right. So to talk a bit more on the situation on the ground, mm -hmm. so we have one of the key agreements of the summit was that there would be a buffer zone around mm -hmm. the M4 mm -hmm. highway. Mm -hmm. And this has been one of the key concerns as far as Syria is concerned, mm -hmm. how to make sure that the M4 and M4, M5 highways, mm -hmm. which are of vital strategic importance, mm -hmm. are co completely under their control. Mm -hmm. So this does seem a step in that direction if the ceasefire, if this agreement holds to any extent. The, uh, the yeah. buffer zone itself and the joint patrols. You see, if you, um, if you just go through this uh, document very carefully, you will find that there are lots of ambiguities there. Right. Uh, evidently, it is, uh, these ideas have not been fleshed out. Right. Now, big questions come up here. One is, um, uh, are the Turks still holding on to their stance? that uh, the uh, Syrians must retreat mm. to the line beyond the, their so-called observation towers, 12 observation towers, that is the line that was drawn by the Sochi agreements before this offensive began. Or uh, if this uh, patrolling takes place, does it imply that the territories which have been uh, regained by the uh, government forces, right. Syrian government forces, mm -hmm will continue to be in their position, or rather, in other words, that this is going to be, uh, that they are freezing the situation on the ground, and a, uh, a, a new normal right. is coming, into, coming to prevail there. Now, this is a very important uh, distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't throw much light on that. And on this, uh, if, if, uh, if this document had mentioned something about the status of these observation posts, we could have deduced, but it is completely silent on that. So um, by March 15 or something, the uh, defense establishments, defense ministries of the two sides are supposed to flesh this out. By then we may get a better picture. Mm -hmm. But um, if the Russian assessment is that the ceasefire is not going to hold, all this is hypothetical. Right. Now, uh, this joint patrolling idea is not new in the Russian-Turkish uh, tango. Uh, it, Idlis, as you know, is in the south uh, northwestern part. Now, there is the northeastern part, Euphrates side, right. where at one time Trump said that he was withdrawing the, the troops service. and the Americans withdrew. Yeah. And into that vacuum, Russians were very smart. They just moved in right. with the Syrian forces. So the Syrian forces are there, and then uh, in October last year, Turks and the Russians worked out an agreement for joint patrolling. Exactly. But joint patrolling takes place, but uh, Syrians are present there on the border. Is this also going to be on the same pattern? Right. Is, in other words, the question, mm -hmm. big question. Uh, then another aspect is there is complete silence about Al-Qaeda you know, in this one. So the Turks have not committed themselves. Mm -hmm. You see, as far as I can see, all that, uh, considering that, you know, they had a profound relationship with uh, the Al-Qaeda groups, uh, you know, this, these fellows who are now under some other name in, uh, yeah, in, in Idlib, they essentially, they rebranded themselves. Right. So it's not a very difficult thing to do. Uh, Putin can, I mean, Erdogan can give word 
that uh, they will now do more forcefully. And these groups can just disband and reappear tomorrow, day after tomorrow under some other name. And uh, the show can continue. In fact, the Russians themselves have openly said also, Russian commentaries, that they expect these people, because you know now the Turkish troops are operating um, almost embedded with the groups, the, the, the rebel groups. That's how they got killed, this uh, 34, 33, yeah, 33, some people say up to 100 people ah, got killed. Right. So all they do is they disband these people and uh, give them Turkish uniforms. You cannot make out, Al-Qaeda groups can operate again, you know, there. So there is no certainty as to uh, the basic, the fundamental Russian uh, argument that uh, the Sochi agreements never really gave any kind of uh, uh, leeway for the Al-Qaeda groups to operate. It, these are groups which are in the terrorist list of America, United Nations, Russia, and even Turkey. So the Syrian government forces are only acting against a terrorist group uh, which has been permitted under the Sochi agreement. So you see the, the, there is a lot of sophistry there in the Syrian position, which in the in the Turkish position, right. and uh, there how they are going to perform in the coming period right. bears watch. So, according to what you're saying, what it looks like is maybe a couple of at the best a couple of weeks or maybe a month of ceasefire for the Syrian soldiers to sort of get reinforcements, yes. some rejuvenation, and then yes. probably launch a fresh offensive against some of those areas. It's, it's a very valid point, you know that. Uh, uh, Russians also may have uh, settled for this because uh, the Syrians have been moving at great speed. And uh, uh, frankly, uh, I think that they are fallen short of expectations in the sense that the Turks have reinforced and have brought in a very modern weaponry into it. And you know, the Turks are one of the uh, they have one of the best stockpiles of drone attack aircrafts. Right. So they have uh, moved in a lot of them, weaponry into that. So they have a lot of firepower today. Mm -hmm. And uh, something like 7,000, 8,000 regular Turkish troops are inside. So you see, uh, the Syrians, uh, Russians also would be keen to see that the Syrians uh, uh, consolidate. Right. You see, there is a theory that, uh, you know, that the Russians' influence on uh, Assad is uh, not total and uh, th there could be problems between Russia and Syria. I don't much uh, lend credence to it. I think they, uh, they uh, synchronize well, they communicate with each other well and uh, they have a big picture, there's no doubt about it. So the Russians also may have thought that uh, it will be useful for the Russians, to, uh, Syrians to get some time to consolidate right. there. So finally it leaves Erdogan in a very difficult position because if the offensive is to resume soon, he either has to commit more uh, of his soldiers, more of his forces and resources into what could be an all-out war, or he has to deal with the withdrawal of all these elements and he has to find out ways to accommodate them, which is actually likely to be a big crisis. You know, in uh, my opinion, uh, they are actually sailing in the same boat, right. that uh, neither of them uh, is in a position to compromise on this. Right. First, let me mention the Russian side. What will happen if the Russian side, uh, listening to um, pleas by Erdogan, if they retreat? As I said, Turkish performance on the Al-Qaeda front has been very dismal. Exactly. Now, if that repeats, then what will happen is, and, and those Al-Qaeda groups, by the way, are not only getting support from uh, uh, Turkey, they are also getting support from Western intelligence agencies. Right. And uh, there are reports uh, that even the American supplies are coming to them, uh, to these groups, which is a very terrible thing to say, you know, if that is really the case. But, you know, such things happen in Syria. So if that is the case, then what will happen is those chaps will keep firing now missiles and things at the Russian bases and other places. Mm -hmm. So then Russians will have to either attack them, vanquish them. If they vanquish them, this kind of a confrontation can take right. place. And uh, uh, now the Russian control over the air space, Syrian airspace, is being uh, steadily challenged by the Turks. So then uh, the Russians actually get uh, bogged down in a quagmire there. And on the other hand, if they do it like this, it can damage the relationship with Turkey. 
seriously. And I think uh, so we are getting somewhere close to that. And uh, despite their wishes, the relationship is getting damaged and there is a trust de deficit developing. For example, uh, Russians say that these 34 uh, soldiers that you mentioned were killed by the uh, Syrians and Syrian uh, jets, Syrian missiles and so on. Uh, the Turks also are saying, uh, op uh, on the one hand they are saying that uh, they were killed by the Syrians so they are badgering the Syrians. But on the other hand, they know very well and most people believe that they were actually killed by the Russian jets. But so Turks don't say uh, the Russian jets because in that case, retaliation has to be against Russia. Exactly. So, you know, this sort of a situation. When you come to the Turkish side, um, in fairness to Erdogan, he is having a problem there. You know, it's no small number, 3.7 million uh, people as refugees. And they are putting a lot of pressure on the social sectors, economy, and uh, um, Turks are not liking it. Right. The Turks means the natives right. are not liking it. So there is a, uh, Erdogan's popularity is sliding down. And this intervention in uh, Syria has become controversial in Turkey. When uh, a closed door session of the parliament took place last week, the just big rioting took place in the parliament chamber, opposition and government, right. you know. That is the kind of heated arguments and so on ensued. So that is a kind of uh, uh, polarization that has taken place within Turkey. So he has to act because if more people come, and according to the United Nations, uh, over a million people are somewhere near the Turkish border threatening to come in. Right. That, is, that is there. And then uh, he is not getting any support, as I mentioned earlier, from the Western countries. So he's on his own. And uh, let us face it, it's a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. For Russia, it's not a neighboring country. Right. Russia is involved there in terms of fighting the terror groups. But for Erdogan, it is the neighboring country. And in all this, ultimately, the core issue is the Kurdish problem. That is, uh, you know, uh, lurking there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are in control of vast tracts in northern Syria and they have American support, and that area is out of bounds for Turks and Russians and Syrians and everyone. So uh, a kind of a Kurdistan is forming there. Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that is worrisome for uh, Turks. So you see, I don't think it is so much imperial ambitions, Ottoman am ambitions, land grab. I don't think it is that. They, they have, their concerns are quite genuine. Uh, but. Uh, I don't see how a compromise is possible because the uh, Russians cannot stand in the way of the Syrians when Assad says that uh, he is determined to reunite the country. Yes, reunite the country. It's a very legitimate uh, uh, ambition. So this is how it is. So um, both sides are uh, in a predicament. Now, if this continues for some time, what will happen? Uh, I think the Americans are wanting some definitive indications of a willingness on the part of Erdogan to break with the Russians. Right. And they are waiting for that. And one signal that they have already you know, hindered, if Turks can resile from their S-400 missile right. deal with the Russians, mm -hmm. then anything is possible. So you see, uh, pushed to a point I think Erdogan has already changed course from his look east policy. Mm -hmm. He is going back to the Western powers, his natural allies, right. you know. And uh, that option uh, is there. And if that happens, it's very difficult to foresee what happens because if there is a NATO involvement, then it becomes a first rate uh, world crisis because NATO versus Russia kind of thing. NATO doesn't want it. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.